There we go. All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Movement for Musicians Google Hangout. Uh, here we are with Josh Schreiber Shalom. Uh, he is a Feldenkrais practitioner and professional musician. And I'm going to turn it over to Josh and let him tell you a little bit about the instrument he plays and what we're going to be up to today. All right. Well, welcome. Um, this is a little bit odd because I don't know how many here are here, though I see a few uh, familiar names having uh, checked in on the event. Um, and I really would like to uh, start by finding out who's there. Um, who's out here? I wonder if people can just sort of type on the, uh, those of you who are on the Google Hangout, if you could type in something where it says say something, just so I know you're there. I'll tell you a little bit about the instrument I'm playing just so that we can save some time later. Uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a viola da gamba. Um, it's got seven strings and frets, and you play it with a bow. And uh, I'm going to be playing a few bars later on um, as a, a sample from a piece by a guy named um, Karl Friedrich Abel, who was friends with one of Bach's sons. Um, and that was kind of the last hurrah of this instrument in the, um, in the uh, late, uh, late 18th century. And um, I started as a cellist. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. And just seeing, I think I heard some bleeps suggesting there's some people there. Um, all right, I'm just going to keep on going. And uh, Buffy, if you could moni monitor the um, monitor the, the the feeds where people are posting things like that. If people have questions, you can just let me know. Absolutely. So yeah, so this uh, why this viola da gamba? Uh, that's kind of a side story. It just happened to the instrument I play. I grew up as a cellist. Um, as a kid, started maybe third grade. My dad was a fiddle teacher. Started playing the cello at some point. Um, and just about the time that uh, that was in college, and I came to the conclusion that you know what, music is music is what I have to do. I started coming down with debilitating uh, hand pain. With a, it was diagnosed at some point as tendonitis. It was diagnosed at um, some point as a carpal tunnel. The doctors couldn't exactly tell because it didn't seem all that bad to them, And but I couldn't play. Um, playing hurt, and I couldn't hold a felt-tip pen without pain. And uh, as you might imagine, since you're all musicians, um, I'm sorry if any of you are having you know sweats just imagining it. It's really pretty scary. Um, I had this uh, a cycle of uh, a sort of hope and despair every time I went to a new doctor. Um, that they would be able to help me, they would be able to fix me, and then you know they gave me some medication or they gave me some exercises or they like administered some cortisone shot or something like that, which essentially did nothing. It was one doctor who uh, who did you know diagnose some imbalance in muscles and gave me some exercises that were re the most useful exercises I'd gotten so far. And he had also said, by the way, do you do uh, Tai Chi or yoga? And I'd been hearing about this idea of doing something like that uh, from, from my hands. And I asked him, why do you ask? And he said, it's just my experience that people who do one of those modalities, that patients who do one of these modalities ha have a better result. That's what he said. I remember the quote. Because I remember at that moment, they said, OK, that's my permission. This is not something for Western medicine. And so I did start doing Tai Chi, and I got myself a few lessons in the Alexander Technique, which, quite frankly, changed my life. And uh, we'll get to Feldenkrais in a moment. That's where I ended up. But from the Alexander Technique, I learned that it was something I was doing. It was the way I was moving that was causing the problem. Uh, tai Chi gave me a practice. To, to get better and better at it, moving when I couldn't play my instrument. And finally, when I discovered Feldenkrais, I found, I found the piece I needed because Feldenkrais allowed me to um, zero in on exactly what it was I was doing that was, uh, was getting in my way. Um, so I did that for a few years. I realized that for me, I messed myself up so bad, I needed to uh, completely relearn how to move. Um, and when I was finally ready to start playing again, I decided to start playing an instrument 
other than the cello because I had all these expectations and old bad habits in the way I played the cello and I'd always loved early music you know Renaissance and Baroque and medieval music um, and so uh, and I live in Boston where there are some wonderful uh, teachers and so I started playing this I started playing viola da gamba and I ended up getting a master's degree on it at Longy School of Music and um, and now now I play professionally and what I find is that being a person who does Feldenkrais um, helps me not it didn't just it's not just what made it possible for me to play when I had previously been unable to play it has an effect on my playing now I know some of you uh, brought instruments because I mentioned that in the Facebook uh, post so I, you will have a chance to play in just a bit um, but but before we do that I'd actually like to share some of my own playing with you and uh, give you a sense of how I approach my instrument with Feldenkrais method and how I approached it before. I know it was a different instrument but an interesting thing happened when I picked up um, the gamba instead of the cello it turns out it was still the same me even though I had done all this Feldenkrais and all this Tai Chi and an awful lot of Alexander technique when I sat down to play I still had some of the same habits about how I go about making music so it was more than a question of knowing how to move my hands that was a crucial thing but I had to change my attitude to how I make music so right now um, I'll just uh, take this thing and move over so you can see it and um, you'll get a chance to do a little bit uh, here a little bit before and after and this is where I really want us to be able to um, hear uh, to be able to hear from you um, um, in comments or whatever notice the two ways that I play this um, I'd like to hear from you what your observations are before I say anything about it. So if you're um, if you can if you're on the Google uh, event, that's perfect. Um, if you're on the Facebook event, um, I'll just I'll just hop over there and check when I get back, and we'll see if anybody had any something anything to say there. Okay. So let me get this. You can see me. Oh, you can get even better than that. Yeah, this is this is my Feldenkrais table. This is where I give uh, one of the places I give private lessons. Edit this part of the recording. Right? Okay. So the first few bars of piece. This is probably how I would have uh, approached it before I did Feldman first. I know, didn't know how to play this instrument, but I know what, how I moved then, and it was something like this. Undo all of that. I'm going to give that one more shot because I feel like I was still in my old self a little bit as I did. It's very strange to play this off into the ether, but I'm curious. Uh, 
Anybody have any thoughts? I have one. I have one person in here, so the world who's whose wonderful home this is. So if I can't get any feedback from here, I'm going to uh, pick on you. <laughs> um, let's see. Well, good. Somebody has the sound. I hope you got uh, a chance to hear it. Um, so any thoughts? A close-up of the right hand. Well, that would be a little bit of a challenge. Um, we can try. I can show you how I play generally with the right hand. I'll come and play, bring it up close. I don't think there was much of a difference, though, in between the before and after in the way I hold the right hand. It might have been subtle. I mean, there was a difference in everything. So this would be, I'm just going to do a couple of notes. This would be the before. Mm. You guys, something more than my right hand here. Okay. And this is the after. Did anybody have any thoughts about the music? Any differences in the music between before and after? Um, Buffy, uh, you can chime in. Yeah, I was just going to going to say something because now and earlier when you when we did this, the feeling for me was very visceral. I could tell the difference, um, really, kind of more in my gut and in my chest. The both pieces sounded lovely, but the one felt different within my whole system. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, it felt really different to me, I can tell you that. But I think this is the interesting thing, and I think this is, this is the reason I wanted to do this demonstration, because um, the biggest uh, <laughs> rib, Misha Forrester says rib caged. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, and I thought that there was an interesting thing that you could see. Um, the way I used to hold the cello, I don't know if there are any cellists out there, uh, would have been this. You know, I sort of supported the instrument on my chest, and I arched my back, and I sort of locked my pelvis forward um, to support it. And the result, that's one thing I did. Another thing I used to do, which I don't know how much I did this time, is I used to sort of like really get into the music. Like, oh, yeah. how many people of you know the cello play? Right, so um, as a teacher of mine actually said at the time, um, I was so busy getting into the music, I couldn't express it. <laughs> couldn't come out the instrument. I was stuck inside the instrument. Um, and the difference that makes a difference for us, for musicians, is the quality of the sound, is the quality of the music. Um, a fuller quality, um, Brian says. Um, and my old style looked, yeah, was more awkward. Without a doubt, it was the more awkward. Um, uh, so the question is then, uh, what I was saying the Feldenkrais method gave me was an ability to break this down into specifics. That, um, you know, I could use my pelvis. Could, I could move from my pelvis. Um, the, when my chest isn't locked and my back isn't locked, the movement from my pelvis gives a, right? I can make that smaller move. It doesn't have to be a very dramatic movement, right? And if I do the same note, not with my uh, pelvis and belly locked, same thing without my pelvis and belly locked, that's all I changed. And you could barely see it because you can't even see my pelvis, right? But the question is, and I heard Sybil over here going, hmm, hmm. <laughs> Um, being fully present in myself as I play. I'd like to share another little thing about details. Um, you know that, that there's an edge to the sound, right? That when the first style of playing, there's a uh, kind of sound to it. I'm holding my breath. You can hear my sound too. 
every once in a while while I'm practicing, um, more than every once in a while, when I'm practicing and learning a piece of music, I tend to go through a phase where I keep on hearing that, that kind of sound. And um, at some point, I ask, where is that coming from? When do I lock that? Well, I was holding my breath, sure enough. I was pushing my tongue against the roof of my mouth. That's one of my habits. But then I tracked down the moment that it happened. And it happened when I was putting my finger down. And as I was putting my finger down, probably a fourth finger, probably further down, I didn't move everything. I didn't know exactly how I was going to get there. I sort of forgot that I had a wrist and an elbow. And I just put my finger there. So if I put my finger there with my left hand, no matter, no matter how much I move my pelvis, if my left hand is free too, you'll get that sound. I'm, so I'm very dead spurt string. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I chose that note. But um, so every little place in me, and this is like musicians, we know, every little thing counts, right? And if there's anywhere in the system that's compromised, the whole system gets compromised. And the question of the ability to sort of track that down in specifics, but also the ability to have the big global uh, patterns like this movement to the pelvis and of the spine, uh, that's what allows us to make a choice about the tension we use. I mean, it's I, if I if I use no effort at all, if I use no force, there'll be no sound, right? But the force doesn't have to be forced. Does that make sense? Let's see. I think I saw a few. I saw a request. Can you play a few measures where the change is most obvious? Um, anybody have a, a, a request for a place where the change is most obvious? Let me just do it one more time. Let's do it one more time and see if now you can see some of the things I'm talking about. This is an experiment, right? Does this, does this communicate over YouTube? Bruce, did that, did that do it for you? One of the reasons I want to do this, and uh, I know I also said that people would have a chance to play and that I would actually keep some movement, but the reason I wanted you to hear me and, and, and hear my before and after and talk about my before and after is because that difference that you can hear that you have trouble figuring, put, putting your finger on, um, that visceral difference that Buffy uh, noticed, it's pretty hard to hear it yourself. When you do a Feldenkrais lesson, the first things you're going to notice, notice are that you feel more comfortable at your instrument. I mean, this including singers too. That it feels more comfortable. It feels easier. Sometimes it feels like you're not doing it right because you're used to the effort. You're used to the feedback of the effort. This is actually very true for wind players and, and, um, and singers. You, you're used, so used to the feedback of the effort that you feel like, I'm not doing it right because it doesn't feel the way you've learned to do it. Um, uh, instrumentalists may feel that like, like kind of like butterfingery. Everything's easier to move, but, but you feel like you're about to drop the instrument. And it just doesn't feel, one of the things that doesn't always feel quite as reliable um, and, um, and, but the, that's the improvement. <laughs> if you hear the music, it sounds different. So I've taught so many workshops and I've taught at, uh, uh, um, New England Conservatory or at Laundry School of Music or Berkeley, um, where I'm teaching conservatory students and, um, we do this before and after and you ask the person afterwards how to feel and, and what do you think and the person after says it felt better. It felt easier. And you ask the room, what did you think? And the room said it sounded better. And it's the 
two things, the tone and the music. Sometimes, though, the second way, the easier way, the more flowing way, the way that makes better music, sometimes we'll have more mistakes. And that's just a process thing. You just have to know that you need to know what you're playing well enough. This is less of an issue for improvisers, actually, because that kind of a mistake isn't much an issue because if the music was right, it's right for improvisers, right? Um, uh, but for us who ha are really locked into playing the notes as they're written, and you just sort of miss one because you didn't force it. And then you go back and you practice. You just go, oh, apparently I didn't know how to reach that note, like that high note after the big chord at the beginning that I played that high note, I keep on missing it, especially when I'm playing better. I keep on missing it. I just need to train myself more about what the distance of that shift is. And, um, and when I'm locked down, I can reach that note reliably, but who cares if the music isn't there? And so that's what I want to share. So let's see if there are any other comments or questions. Um, and then, um, and then I'll, I'll give you a taste of, of a little bit of a, a Feldenkrais lesson. Uh, so find yourself some, a chair that you can sit comfortably in. Um, <laughs> I like that. Bruce says, absolutely, I relaxed automatically right alongside with you. Okay, great. So it's nice to see that I, I came across. Um, right, space for me to breathe, somebody says. So, um, so yeah, are you sitting comfortably? What does that even mean? What does it mean to sit comfortably? Um... Are you trying to sit with good posture? How about you let that go? Let yourself slouch a little bit. All right, so now we're going to do this lesson. Just let yourself slouch. What do you do when you slouch? What's your slouch like? To come out of your slouch, sit up again. Oh, this is so weird without seeing people. <laughs> and then slowly let yourself slouch. So you do this a bunch of times. Slouch a little bit. Sit up. If at any point you get tired, you know, you're just like, oh, this, this, this is uncomfortable. Sit back, like, even before you get, oh, this is uncomfortable. Just you're getting a little bit uncomfortable. Sit back in your chair. Let yourself rest. Just listen to the directions. And then come back to it when you're ready. Okay? So <clears throat> are, we getting, are we getting to know our slouch a little bit? You sl when you start to slouch, what's the first thing that goes? Is it your head? Is it your lower back and your pelvis? Speaking of your pelvis, when you slouch, well, actually, before I go on to that, when you begin to slouch, which is the first thing goes, and when you start to sit up again, what's the first thing that starts to sit up? Again, you pull yourself up by your head, you do something in your chest, you tighten your belly. Do you move your pelvis? And by your pelvis, can you feel the movement of your sitting bones on your chair? Right, there are these two little, they're like two little rockers in there. You can feel them rocking back and forth. Actually, here's an interesting thing. Take your hand, take the flat of your hand. That's great, nobody's looking. Put it under your butt, under one side, and uh, just, just find there, there's a bone in there. Somewhere, you know, you know, there's a butt cheek, but there's also a bone. You just feel that bone. You could even sort of put, put your hip back down on it and rock, you know, rock your pelvis back and forth so you can feel that bone with your hand. Then take your hand out <clears throat> and do this slouch a little bit and unslouch. Yeah. See, I have one person in the room, and she breathes, and I know, I know something's going on right Right? Can you, you can feel the difference between those two sides yet? Yeah, I don't know. Are you, are you already done the other side? You can do the other side. So I just find that other sitting bone. Put your hand under there. And like, there's a bone there, right? You can also feel like how tight the muscles are when you lift it and put it down. It gives you a sense of what it is you're doing. And then put it back down. You can shift your weight a little bit from one to the other. Feel the two sitting bones. Now you're sitting on two points, right? You're more aware of what it is you're actually doing. You were doing that before, but now you have a different awareness of it. And now, let yourself slouch. And then unslouch. And as you do that, can you feel that there's any, maybe, maybe this was obvious to you before, from before, and maybe this is a new question. Can you feel a shift, like 
you're shifting, you're slouching off to the one side or the other. You might feel a shift in the weight on those sitting bones. Slouch a little bit, and then unslouch. I want you to figure out what it is you do. So you could shift the weight a little bit left a few times, or you should shift the weight a few right, right a few times. Figure out which one of those is easier. Or maybe it was clear from the get-go, which you do. Let it be. Let yourself do what you actually do. Sort of like what I was doing on the Gamba, right? I was letting myself play my habitual way. And then I actually get to know what my patterns and what my habits are. OK? Want to take a rest? Is a good time for a rest? Sit back. Sit back in chair. I don't have a back in chair. I can't rest. I can pretend. But I can take a sip of my tea. OK? So you had a little rest. If you think you'd benefit from a little bit more rest, you're like, oh, I don't feel like sitting up again and doing this some more. That means you should take a little bit of longer rest. You can hear the directions, imagining. And then when you're ready, when you're just like, OK, ready, you could do these, you could do these movements, two or three movements. Right? There might be somebody out there with a lot of back pain. If it doesn't feel good, you're not learning anything. And this is so different from the way we usually practice our instruments. OK. So let's ask another question about your slouch. So if you slouch again, and, and you feel what you're doing with your chin and your neck, right? So are you slouching and sticking your chin out? Is that your style? Uh, do you find that you keep on look, looking down, letting your eyes be downcast? Or is your head really going like an elevator, you know, just straight down and up? I'd like to invite you to try each one of those options several times. Slouching and let your chin out. And come back. Notice what happens, not just the chin coming out, but the whole shape of your chest, right? Let me see what a mind does. I sort of round that side a little bit when I slouch. Feel what it is for you. You see, this is really pretty different, is it, than almost any other method of learning how to move. I'm teaching you how to do things wrong because, you know, you do. <laughs> so <clears throat> now do the same thing. Now do the other one, which is let your head down. Look down. Your entire spine, if you were to look at the side, is sort of becoming shaped like a C. The top of your head is pointing forward. Your tailbone, your sitting bones are pointing forward. Your back is rounding back. Very slowly, the journey back is at least as important as the journey there. Okay. You've done that a few times? Feel what that's like? Actually, you know what? Come back, sit up for a moment. Let's make this a little bit more interesting. Uh, a few times, uh, I think breath has been mentioned. Incredibly, incredibly important. It, it's obviously important for people who make music with their breath. Singers or wind players, it is just as important for us string players and keyboard players. Um, except for the fact that we don't know it, which makes it more interesting, more important that we learn. So put one hand on your chest and one on your belly. <clears throat> and if you put it on your belly, you can put it really on your lower belly. <clears throat> Excuse me. Like, um, around your navel or even lower. <clears throat> but you can just put it on your belly. It's not crucial exactly where. And so when you look down, you round your back like that. Your hands, feel your hands come closer together. And when you come out, they come apart. You could actually let your back bend in the other direction. You look up. So you look down, let your head come down, round your back, let your let your self sit back on your bottom, like back onto your pockets and then come back again. And your hands are helping you feel what happens in your front, how your front gets shorter as you go down and gets longer as you come up. Where's the middle? Can you feel the middle? There's down. There's the middle right around there somewhere. Oh, the head came be after the middle, or the head reached there or the middle before the belly or something. Just notice what you're doing and come through the middle. And come back to the middle. Pause for a moment. 
Notice what it's like to sit right now. Maybe maybe now is a good time to rest against the back of your chair. What was happening with your breath? I mentioned that in passing before. Did your hands tell you anything about your breath? When can you remember, because before doing it, can you remember when were you breathing in and when were you breathing out? Was there coordination in the way you were moving with the breath coming in and out? Or maybe you don't know, so let's try it. When you're ready, come forward in your chair. And just do the same thing. The one hand on the chest, one on the belly, and let yourself round your back. Your back becomes like a C. Your head, bow your head. And then come forward through the metal. What are you doing with your breath? I hope you're not looking at me, by the way, because if you're looking at me, then you're looking down your nose when you're tilting your chin up, and that's, that's another thing. Look up at the ceiling when you go down. Look down. You don't, you don't really need to see me. I move out of the camera. Make that easier. Yeah. So if we were in a room now, I'd ask for a show of hands who was breathing out on the way down and who was breathing in on the way down. Most people, it so happens, breathe out on the way down and in on the way up. So let's all do that. Just statistics. Breathe out. You feel, does that help? You can time the movement to the breath. And then come back to the middle. Now we're going to do one of the most classic Feldenkrais tricks, which is whatever you just did, do the opposite. Can you figure out how to go down and breathe in? For a lot of people, that's really, really confusing. So here's a little cheating trick. You let yourself go down and breathe out, and then just stay down and let the breath come in without coming up. And then as the breath comes out, come up. Let your hands come away from each other. Look up towards the ceiling. And then as the breath goes in, come down again. Do you feel a little confused? That's good. That means you're learning something. So let that confusion happen. Be like, oh, I lost it. I switched it. Remember what I was saying about the playing the wrong notes. Let yourself play wrong notes. Let yourself do it bad. Let yourself lose it. Come back. You're in the woodshed right now. Practice it. doesn't really matter. Nobody's listening. Nobody's watching. Nobody's judging. OK. All right, now go back to the easy way again. Maybe that was the easy way for you, but do, the, do your easy way now. And now find your middle. Everybody find the middle there. Take your time. When you get there, first of all, feel what it's like to sit right now. How long could you sit like this? How comfortable are you? And then let yourself slouch a little bit. And then unslouch. Is that an easier transition, or is it different in some way? Okay. Now, I made a big mistake. I was supposed to let you play before I did that. I'm confessing. Um, so what I'd like to let you do is, uh, first of all, before you get your instruments, those of you who have instruments, I'd love to hear from a few people, those of you who are typing in, come out, come out of this nice, gentle place. Figure out how do you get your hands to your keyboard and type a few comments about what you experienced. It's really tricky for me to, to be teaching this in a vacuum. And if you don't, you're not, if you're, for instance, checked in on... Um, Buffy's website, and you can't type anyway, then go ahead and pick up your instrument. And I'd like to invite you, if you pick up your instrument or sing a few notes, to have the same attitude. Do it badly at first. 
do just one note. Don't even play a scale. Something as easy, as easy, as easy as possible. To feel what's different, how do you shape yourself around the instrument, right? Whatever your instrument is, you know, that there are ways that you shape yourself and organize yourself around the instrument. Do you, even before you play a note, you could, if you don't have your instrument, you can imagine your instrument here, and that's every bit as good, if not better. There was an article in today's New York Times about a, 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 was it a loser skeleton uh, racer who did almost all, a lot of his practicing in his imagination. We do that a lot here. So find where, how do you organize yourself to play your instrument? Do you feel anything different? Are you aware of anything different? And then I would love for a few of you to actually play a little bit. And some I heard that some people were actually getting together and they were going to play together. They're going to, you know, so you can play for each other. I'll give you just a few few minutes. Um, those of you who don't have instruments with you or not doing that, I really, really would love to hear some um, some checking in. I know there's some Feldenkrais teachers here who are not instrumentalists, um, but yeah, why don't we let the people who don't know the method yet uh, uh, chime in first and tell them. Tell us a little bit about the experience. Ask, have any questions? Can you see how this could lead to that? How uh, how getting to know yourself, getting to know your habits, your patterns, and becoming aware. We call this process awareness to movement. We call it Feldenkrais method after this guy, Moshe Feldenkrais, who made it up. But this process that, that I just walked you through is an awareness through movement lesson. Do you have more awareness through your movement? Could you imagine maintaining that kind of awareness as you play? I'd like to share a little bit about what, you know, what it does for me. Um, uh, this past December, I played for the, the Christmas Revels in Cambridge. It's like something like 16 shows plus tech rehearsals um, over three weeks. Uh, there were several double headers in a row, and I was I did not have enough room to play. We were on the stage. There were half a dozen musicians. We were cramped in. There was a guitarist to my right who was, frankly, behind the set almost, and I didn't have the heart to push him any farther, and I don't think I could have, and I had the accordion player on my left scooched as far to the left as she could. I just didn't have enough room to play. And now what happens to us musicians when we're doing that? There must be some musicians in there who know exactly what it's like. <laughs> right? And I had to consciously say, like, well, I'm having that urge, so I'm going to choose to not do that. Right? And this kind of awareness is what allowed me to not lock down, to actually play beautifully, including one of the days that, that Yo-Yo Ma was in the audience. Um, the other day I played badly. But it's not because of space. Well, I they kept on bumping into the guitars to my right, and you know, I wasn't going to play badly so I don't bump into him. I play as well as I can, considering that he's there. If I bump, no, it's okay. There's a different way of looking at priorities. We have to look at, we have a lot more choices than we think we do. And I think that when you start realizing how many choices you have in your body, you find that you have a lot more choices in your life, too. Okay. Well, I had built in lots of time here uh, for questions. <laughs> I think people had asked if there were questions. Would anybody be interested, again, as I hand that feedback here, um, in some of the patterns, some of the movement patterns that are important? I would like to share one more thing with you from, from my back, background. This is the, I love this story. Um, so I was learning to play uh, at VL, which is little medieval fiddle. Right? So I'm used to playing this big instrument, playing this little medieval fiddle. Um, and I, I resting it on my leg, you just play it in your lap, much like the large one, um, but it was too small to put between the knees, and I rested it on my on my knee, on my thigh, and I could feel myself tightening my leg. 
as if I was clamping the instrument between my knees. Only it wasn't between my knees, it was on my knee. Right? And uh, my, I commented this to my teacher, who it turns out has done uh, much of a, an Alexander Dickman training. And I say, I feel like I'm tightening my leg to stabilize the instrument, even though I know it doesn't help. And she looks at me and she says, you're not stable tightening your leg to stabilize your instrument. You're tightening your leg to stabilize your mind. She was very, very, very right. It explained to me something else I knew about myself. When I was a kid, practicing my cello, let's see, I'll move back a little bit. I knew, I'm going to hold this, my bow like a cellist, that I could, I could never make it to the end of my bow without lifting my shoulder. If I, or dropping my wrist. I just couldn't figure out how to do that. It's because I didn't know I can move back further a little bit for you to see this. Uh, well. I didn't know that I had shoulder blades, basically. For me, my arms were this long. That's how long they are. Now, that doesn't look really wrong to you, except for when I let them actually extend to their full length. Yeah. What's the difference between this and that? It took me years. It probably took me till that teacher, uh, Dana Maven, made that comment to realize that I was stabilizing my mind by stabilizing my center. Right now, I'm very focused. I'll hit right notes, and I'll get things done, but I won't be able to play, and I will be miserable, and my hands will stop working because they don't have any support for my body. It took years, of the Feldenkrais person method, to realize that my arms are actually, there's more space here, part of my back, or not part of my back, the integrated commitment, right? To learn how to connect them this way, and this way, and this way, so that each finger, each finger can spiral out of my center. And that when I put my finger down on, the, on my instrument, that movement is directed for my pelvis. It comes from the floor, is directed by my pelvis, and through everything to do that. And I cannot do that if I'm concentrating too hard. I just want to. So that's my own experience with my own um, ADHD, turns out. I just didn't know about it as a kid. And so people ask me how I got tendinitis. I say it's because of my ADD. Um, but it took Feldenkrais to figure it out. And ADD medication, that doesn't solve the problem. It actually helps me hyperfocus. It helps me get into that blocked and I have to stay aware of myself. It's the only way. So I thought I'd share that too. Maybe that, maybe that resonates with someone. So if there are no other questions, are there no questions? Let me see. I'm going to flip over to the uh, Facebook event here and see if anybody's posting here. Oh, I see somebody wasn't working for. Oh, I'm so sorry. There's some people on Facebook who are not be able to able to get in. Um, um, uh, Buffy, can you check in with the people on um, uh, on the Facebook event? Because there's some people who haven't been able to get into Google Hangout. Um, and just direct them to your site or something. Uh, so, if there aren't more questions, uh, I would like to share with you some ways that you can go on and, um, and learn more. Uh, first of all, uh, Buffy and I are both very available. Um, if you think of more questions, if you want to give us feedback, I would love feedback about how is this useful for you. Was there something that you thought might, um, that, a question you wanted to ask but you couldn't because you weren't on the Google Hangout? Uh, technical questions directed to Buffy, who I thank you very, very much for setting this up. Um, also, so, uh, ways you can continue. 
First of all, the reason Buffy has, has been so generous to, to set this up for me is because she's also uh, uh, given me the great opportunity also to come um, and uh, work and with her students in Albany. So next, uh, next weekend, next Sunday, um, March 2nd, uh, we're going to be doing a full day workshop where we're going to explore some of these ideas, um, learn to move from the pelvis, um, learn to free the breath and free the ribs, um, learn to connect the arms to the pelvis. So those are the, some of the things I think we're going to do. It depends on who exactly is there. Um, uh, some people uh, will get a chance to actually get um, a little bit of coaching, you know, try and get a sense of what the issues are there and uh, make sure to uh, actually give some people some coaching on the instrument so that we can all learn from it so it's not just watching me. I don't think I'm going to bring my own instrument. So that's going to be next uh, next Sunday, March 2nd. Um, Monday, March 3rd, I will, uh, in the morning and early afternoon, I will also be uh, giving some private lessons, some private hand hands-on lessons. I could also be giving lessons with your instrument. So that's, that's for you, those of you who are in um, the capital region, near Albany. Um, and uh, here in Boston, in the Boston area, um, I regularly teach uh, classes, workshops, and private lessons. You can find me at discoveryourself.com, discover-yourself.com. Um, I am starting a class at the end of March, uh, beginning of April. I'm doing a, a pair of workshops in a related class, which is all about these spiraling patterns. It was just sort of demonstrating, but just one, uh, uh, one way in. I think it's really, really useful, particularly for musicians. Uh, singers and wind players, too, because if you can clarify this area here, I don't think I need to say anything more. If you have less effort here, it can make a big difference to what you do. Um, and um, I'm also, uh, I teach and, um, and uh, have been organizing a series of events at uh, Berkeley College of Music. Um, uh, Misha Forrester, who is on this call too, is going to be teaching a, a wonderful thing the first Thursday of the uh, um, the first Thursday in March um, on uh, on the tongue trip, thrillingly off the tongue, and I'll be teaching. So I'll be in the evening, and I'll be teaching a workshop on uh, Wednesday before that, not the day before, the week before, 26, on the lips, reading your lips, learning to love your lips. Um, people who are elsewhere might want to travel somewhere and take some time off to do something like this. In um, in uh, the end of June, the last uh, week in June, I'll be teaching um, music and Feldenkrais at uh, uh, World Fellowship Center, worldfellowship.org, in, um, in, by the way, Albany, New Hampshire, which is right near Concord. And the following weekend, all of this is on my website. And if it isn't yet, it will be soon. Uh, the following weekend, I'm going to be teaching a four-day workshop uh, retreat um, over Fourth of July weekend, um, Thursday through Sunday, on the breath, which is another pattern I think is essential to all musicians and human beings. So there are some ways you can continue. And um, I think that's about what I have to say. Buffy, anything I left out? I think that was everything. Um, we are hoping that this recorded. Uh, if so, then people can always revisit it. Uh, were there any questions from anyone watching? Can you give us some type of simple exercises to connect the arms to the center? OK, yes. Okay, yeah, well, I don't know how simple it is, but let's, let, let's, let's pick up exactly where we left off. Okay. And um, I'm going to back a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, by the way, we don't usually demonstrate in the Feldenkrais method um, because I want you to figure out, we want you to figure out how you do things yourself. But because I can't see you, and if you're not, if you understand, it's a very interesting thing, in fact, when you understand something differently than the way I meant it. That means, I mean, it might be something the way I said it, um, and it just reveals something about the translation necessary between thought and action. Um, so we lose out on that when we demonstrate. But since I can't see you, I'd like you to see me, so you at least know the starting point. Um, 
So let's come back to this movement of you know rounding and arching. And this time, instead of having your hands on your belly and your chest, put your hands on your thighs. And you'll notice something interesting. This is going to connect not just your arms. First thing you're going to connect is your legs, your hips. Can you feel that your knees, your thighs move forward and back? There's a little bit of movement in your ankles. And you can feel that. And having your hands there, hands are very, very sensitive. Having your hands there will help you amplify that or, or clarify. It's almost like you could take your thighs and move them back and cause yourself to roll your back by moving your thighs back or send them forward, or send your knees over your toes. Okay. Now if you let your hands just ride, start letting them slide. So that when you round your back, your hands come towards your hip joints, and when you arch your back, your hands come towards your knees. And they just slide. Just feel the connection. Make this so it's, it's almost passive. Right? You're doing the movement from your center, from your pelvis. Now, at some point, if you get your hands so they start to slide off the front of your knees, you can instead still feel like your hands are sliding on your thighs, like they're sliding like, like airplanes on runways, and they just get take off and then come back down. Maybe you could do it like that with your fingers. Why don't you just let your fingers hang so it's just from your your wrist? Because I think for us musicians, we need to do other things with our fingers. The power of the arm and the power that comes through the finger comes from the center, right? But the uh, the fingers themselves can be then free. Fingers in the form where most of the finger muscles are can be free to do the fine-tuning of where exactly those fingers go. Send it away and come back. Okay, pause for a moment. This being a filming Christmas le lesson, chances are you're going to do something the other way. And we're just going to do it that exactly. And so let's come back to just this is the easy version of this lesson. Your hands slide forward. And they come up there, and then just sort of leave them there as you round your back again. And you do this from the side, so you see what I'm talking about. And then round your back. That's for those of you who don't understand what, what I'm talking about. If you understand what I'm talking about, please don't look at the screen. Because, you know, you look up, look down. You feel, feel, look wherever you look. That's another reason we don't demonstrate. Because if we demonstrate, then the eyes in that are looking at the teacher, and that's not the movement. That's something else. So you can lift your hands up around your back, and then when you arch your back again, bring your hands back towards your hips. Some of you, I mean, if everybody's done martial arts, you might have the urge to bring your hands back and to close them so to spiral them. That's fine if that makes sense. If it doesn't, you know, bring back this way. So now I'm bringing my hand out by rounding my back and bringing it towards me by arching. Or bring my hand away by arching. And first move that around it. Now you get to see for a moment what you can do with this. Whatever instrument you play, um, you can do you can develop yourself some version of this. So round your back and right? So it's the arching of the back. For me, it's called a push bow. It's actually the power stroke for these violinists and cellists out there. It's the opposite. Very because it's going in the direction of the karate chop. It's going in the direction of the, the pinky thing. Um, this is the anatomy of it. So if the hand's this way, that's going to be the power stroke. That didn't make any sense? Don't worry about it. So I'm arching my back and rounding it. And you, that would be pretty familiar from this thing I did, right? Now you can do it the other way. I'm going to round my back and then arch it to do the pull stroke. So that's really. I have to do this. And then ultimately, can you arch and round and arch and round one stroke? So 
So my hand is now connected to my pelvis. That answer the question for whoever asked it. It's a simple exercise to start getting a sense of a rather complex concept. Okay? Um, the, the same thing can be done, by the way, with rotation. So if you know any of those following types of rotation lessons, right? I can coming from my pelvis, or I can go the other way. Close open. Either way, I can make circles with my pelvis too. If anybody knows the pelvic block. So that the movement of the pelvis, like the movement of the breath, can come and go, can ebb and flow, but in whichever direction it's going from, it's allowing me to move my hand from my center in relation to my center. Yeah. Is that, that's a good question. Ralph, did that? Did that give? Did that satisfy your beginning of your curiosity? I actually hope it piques your career curiosity, and you want to do more. I guess I should say one more thing: if where you are, there aren't Feldenkrais teachers, and you want to do Feldenkrais, um, I do have a lot of my lessons uh, recorded. I tend to record pretty much every lesson I teach. Um, a little bit less than mus lessons I do with musicians, because if somebody's playing before and after, it doesn't work as well. Uh, but I have a lot of lessons recorded. So if you're somewhere where there aren't any Feldenkrais teachers, um, uh, these recordings are as is. I don't process them. I just record them, and then I stick them online. And I ask for like five bucks for an hour-long lesson. Just um, So I do have some people I work with who live in places uh, where there aren't teachers. And, um, and we sort of, it's sort of a learning by correspondence. It really helps us see each other face to face. But you know, Google Hangout and Skype can work for that. That's what's necessary if you're somewhere far away. Um, again, you can find me at discover-yourself.com, um, and um, and I'll, I'll just put that right there so you can find me. Um, and you can find me right there on Google. So, Joshua Schreiber, Shalane, Josh Feldenkrais, Boston. Just Google it; you'll find me. Okay, seven oh one. I think that. Uh, out does it unless somebody else has another question. I'm happy to stay for a little bit longer if anybody has questions, but otherwise, it's been a pleasure and I would love to hear from you because again, this is just sending something off into the ether and it would be like nice to know where and how it landed. And uh, uh, another thing, by the way, you can go, when I go to my website and uh, join my email list, and I have a sub list specifically for musicians, and um, I'll be, you know, posting blog posts and things like that to that list. So if you're interested in what I do, even if you're not local, I, I hope you'll go and um, uh, uh, connect through there. My website doesn't feature the blog right now, but it's it's undergoing the kinds of changes that websites undergo, and uh, there will be more of that in the coming months and years. Okay, Buffy, back to you. Great. Thank you, Josh. That was fantastic. Um, so just to let people know, too, if you're interested in doing the workshop in Albany, then you can find out more about that by going to consciousmovements.com forward slash music. And we'll put all the links uh, that Josh mentioned as well as this link um, in this event, and it'll be there for you. And hopefully... Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and hopefully this is recorded, as I said earlier, and we'll be able to sh share it later on. And so any questions before we head out? All right. Well, thank you again, and thank you, Josh. And thank you, Buffy. This has been really, really fun, really different. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, I hope to do it again <laughs> sometime, you know. And, uh, uh, successive approximations would only get better, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Take care. Be in touch. Goodbye.